I have 46 slides and 40 minutes to do it in, so I'm going to go a little fast. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I will be available afterwards for questions. So we'll do a few quick slides while everybody's still getting their seats. A little bit about me, which really isn't that special. I'm one of those lucky folks that gets to be a pen tester every day. It's wonderful. I'm actually based out of DC. That is a very long flight from DC to here, but it is worth it because you guys are awesome. I specialize in uh, physical penetration testing and social engineering, and I also get to go to awesome places like this and talk to awesome folks like you. So quick thanks to my company, SecureCon, for making that happen. So I like to start things off with a little story while everybody gets situated. Nobody likes Mondays. Nobody is at their best Monday morning. So picture, if you will, it's early Monday morning. It's about 8.30. You know, the 9 o'clock crowd is still kind of trudging in. I've got my hands full that morning. I've, I've got my purse. I've got my, my laptop bag. I've got an umbrella because it's going to rain that day. And uh, lunchbox, purse, I'm talking on my cell phone, and I'm walking to the door like this trying to hold on my stuff. You know, it's 8.30, everybody's starting to come in that day for work. Guy in front of me holds the door. I keep talking on my phone and give him the, the thanks glance over my shoulder. I get on the elevator that somebody so kindly holds for me. I go to the third floor. I get off the elevator. I go down the hallway, find an empty conference room. Perfect. I start up my laptop. I go down to the break room. I fill up my coffee. The only problem with this is that I don't actually work in this building and that they were just part of a pen test that failed very, very badly. This happens a lot more often than you would think. So I always like to do tests on Monday mornings when they let me, but a lot of times companies won't let me because they know it's not going to end well in their favor. So what happened there? Right? So, that, so that company had some amazing technology deployed. They had some of the, the latest stuff on the market, you know, those red things that sit in the racks with the blinky lights. You know, they update their antivirus because antivirus keeps us safe, right? You know, they use two-factor authentication, RSA, and all that good stuff. Yet they were just compromised from the inside because nobody ever thought about, hey, we probably shouldn't hold the door for people that look like they work here without checking their badge. After that, they didn't even know that I was there because their fantastic IDS didn't have any rules for things like internal port scanning because why would anybody port scan from the inside? We watch for that on the outside. So lots of, lots of things that could have uh, been improved on there. So what is social engineering? It's kind of, kind of my thing. So persuading another person to provide information or to perform an action to aid an attacker. So we're going to get into some more examples of this later, but it isn't always about information. But while we're talking about information, what kind of stuff are we looking for? Good stuff. Stuff that I'm probably not supposed to know. Things like proprietary data, passwords, IP addresses, employee ID numbers. It's so easy to get employees to give you their ID number because they don't think that it's important. Yet, when I call the help desk posing as a user, that's usually what they ask me for, is that trust piece to get their password reset. So lots of employees don't understand what they're giving away. Why does social engineering work? I mean, these people know that they're not supposed to do this, right? They know that they're not supposed to tell you their secrets or things that shouldn't be public. So why do they do it? People like to be helpful. We're taught that from the very beginning. Do unto others, right? They're unaware of the threat. They don't really think that there are people out there that would pretend to be somebody else. Why would they pretend to work here? They look like they work here. They act like they work here. They must belong here just like I do. Free information. This is one of my favorites. So we all know when you're building a, a password list for brute forcing, you need two pieces of information, right? We need the username and we need the password. If I don't technically know how the password stuff works yet, that's okay. I'm going to get the username stuff figured out. This takes a 30 second call to the help desk. This is Martha and I've been on vacation for a long time and I can't get my computer logged into the network. 
I know that the password is right because I use the same password for everything. Um, could it be that, that username thing that's wrong? And nine times out of ten, that poor help desk person will come back and say, oh, Martha, it's, you know, M. Thomas. And, you know, your password should work. They don't ask for any verification. They don't think that the username is sensitive because it hasn't been ingrained in their brain that way. So they think username, not sensitive. It's okay. But we all know that that's one piece of the two-piece puzzle that I need. So why would we use social engineering and penetration testing? Couple reasons. One, it works. Two, the bad guys use it all the time. And it works for them. So unless they're properly testing and addressing this issue, it's never gonna get any better. So this is my little favorite plug, I have to put it in here. Technology will continue to advance, but the greatest vulnerability will always exist in the human behind the keyboard. I don't think it's gonna change anytime soon. So this social engineering stuff sounds kind of cool. If you do it a lot, you don't really think about it anymore. But if you're newer to it and you kind of want to get started or you just want to understand how it works, this is basically how it works at a high level. The majority of your time in social engineering is spent gathering information. If I'm going to look like and act like and talk like I belong somewhere, then I need to understand that environment so that I can do all of those things effectively. First stop when I'm going to do my homework is the company website. It's there to tell people about their company. They want to get the word out. They want to talk about who they are, what they do, what they sell. And of course, they want you to be able to get in touch with them. So usually a company website is full of good things with, with phone numbers and email addresses stuff that I'm going to start keeping a good running index of for a couple of reasons. What else is on there? Well, they're probably hiring for something, right? And if you're hiring for something, you need to tell them what it is that they're supposed to know about. So we'll look at that here in a minute. So I picked a bunch of different companies to kind of mix this up a little bit. I didn't want to pick on one in particular because that's just not very nice. Bank of America. We started here. So as you can see from the red down there in the bottom corner of my search bar, I'm looking for the at sign, I'm looking for their email addresses. They, being security conscious, have hid them so that you can't use screen scraping programs and things that go out and kind of automate that. That's great, but all you have to do is just hover over the link and it'll tell you what the email address is. So big deal, it's an email address, it's for fraud or something, right? So Google is everybody's friend. We take that email address that we, we know is valid and we go out to Google and we start to look around. So notice some of these things on the box in the, I guess that's your, your left, uh, left hand side. I wasn't in the military, I don't know right and left. Um, in the box, you know, you've got a couple usernames. Those, those are good, right? We're gonna put those in our list since we've already probably made a call and we know what the username list is supposed to look like. But those service accounts, those other two down there at the bottom, those are really important too. Those are important for a few reasons. One of which is that employees, and in this case, customers, are used to seeing emails from these addresses. So they trust these addresses because they're, they're known, they're common. The other way that this may be of value is if they're running any kind of DLP implementation, a lot of times there are certain email addresses that are whitelisted so that they can send out stuff that's sensitive, bank statements and whatnot. So if you get an address that's whitelisted in DLP, you can use that to your advantage to exfiltrate your data once you've got inside and found the good stuff. We all need help sometimes, I understand. But when you're gonna do something on, on a technical forum like this and put chunks of code in there, don't use your company email address. So I found this using the same techniques that I just talked about, looking at Google, using the email address schema, and just browsing through the results. So I haven't actually port scanned anybody yet. I haven't fired up Metasploit, but I already have good IPs and good credentials. And back to the job thing. They're hiring, this is fantastic. 
Um, so let's see what we have here. We've got a little bit of Windows, a little bit of Linux. Okay, fine. Lots of Apache. Uh, guess what I don't see listed on here? I don't see any IIS. Fantastic. Now I know a little bit about how I need to make my exploits. Um, they also put in their monitoring system, which I thought was kind of, kind of interesting. Um, you know, if you're going to use an IDS, you probably shouldn't tell me what one you use. All good things to put on our little list of stuff that we should know. So we've learned a little bit about the company. Let's move on and learn a little bit about the people. Social media is fantastic for social engineers. I don't remember how I used to do this so effectively without social media. Everybody's got a Facebook page, right? I mean, even the military and the government organizations, they, they have their own. I guess it's good PR or something. So if I want to find out who works at this organization or who's associated with it in some way, I'm going to start checking out this Facebook page for things such as likes, for comments on different posts that they have, who's sharing their posts. Those people probably, A, work, or B, want to work there. Facebook's also implemented some great features that make my life a lot easier. I can also search for people by their employer, because nobody would just put out there that they work for a certain government agency now, would they? Uh, apparently, uh, DLA also hires dogs and those in Santa outfits, if anybody is looking. So the other cool thing about social media is, you know, we, we have this tendency to want to tell everybody what we're doing, but we also want to tell everybody where we are. This map may look a little bit familiar, as it's the map to this building. Bing has this very cool feature called Twitter mapping. So you can actually search by an address and map out all of the tweets that have been from that location. I think it's back to two weeks. So when folks are tweeting stuff and they don't have location services turned off on their phone, I can plot your stuff on the map. So if I'm going to call a help desk or I'm going to try to impersonate an employee someday, it would be really handy for me to know that they're not in the office that day. So now I know that they're not in the office, but I also know where they are and that there's no way that they're going to swing by that afternoon to check on things. The other cool thing about Twitter mapping, which kind of sort of approaches stalker level, is that uh, you can actually use it to search tweets for one person across time. So we can see how this fine gentleman here has uh, hopped all around the country and told everybody about where he is and what he's doing. I also thought this was funny that he's, uh, the top tweet there is from, from DEF CON and he's talking about social engineering, so I had to keep it in the slide deck. I wonder where these people work. Any, anybody know? I, I'm, I'm not really sure. I, I'm really interested about the ones in the middle, but um, I'll let you do your own research on that. So aside from social engineering, if I was looking to Mm, acquire somebody for, I don't know, maybe a, a confidential informant kind of thing. Uh, you know, it would be pretty easy to figure out who I'd want because they're telling me where exactly they are all day long. So you start to look at those tweets and you start to figure out who those people are personality-wise. So maybe they're having financial troubles or maybe they're having troubles in their relationship those are things that motivate people to turn into CIs or other things. So it's not just social engineers that use this stuff, it's uh, lots of other opposing forces as well. So a lot of times companies leave us some really um, good documents out on their website. Not necessarily anything that they type, but it's what they don't type that's important. Anybody here use FOCA a little bit? Hand or two. Hey, there's a hand. Okay, I can't see anything because that's light. That light is right in my face. Cool. So for those of you who don't use Foca, Foca is a free tool by Informatica. Uh, you can Google for it, and it will take you there. It basically goes out and collects documents from a domain that you point it to, pulls them down, and analyzes all the metadata contents that are in those documents. So as you can see here, uh, you can get a really good idea of software versions that this place is running. 
uh, usernames. It harvests usernames really well. Um, not always very well on the passwords, but you know, one of two pieces, right? But it's a free tool, and it doesn't really take that much time to learn how to use. So if you're going to be a pen tester, I'd recommend uh, learning how to use that. So we have a lot of data, right? We just uh, basically mapped out where this company is, who works there, what they're doing, where they're doing it, and what kind of software they have. It's a lot of stuff. So it's kind of overwhelming if you don't really know what to do with all that information. Social engineers basically use three buckets for their attacks. You've got phone attacks, physical attacks, and virtual attacks. So if you're going to do a phone attack, it's going to sound really silly, but figure out who you're supposed to be before you pick up the phone and try to be them. It would amaze you the, the number of failed calls that I've seen. The person gets on the phone and they ask for their name and they freeze because they can't remember the name of the person that they're supposed to be. All right, study your cover before you ever pick up the phone. All right, learn about this person. They just told you everything about their life on Facebook and Twitter. Okay, write, write it down. You know, make, make a profile. Learn who that is. Know what you're looking for. Sounds kind of silly, right? I mean, you know, if you're making your call, it's usually for a good reason. But once you get on that phone, sometimes you, you panic and you forget. Uh, there we go. So we also need to develop a list of trust pieces in addition to that data that we have about the person. So a trust piece would be something that I can throw at the person I'm trying to social engineer that makes them think that, oh, this person is who they say they are and they belong here. A lot of times what I'll do on phone calls, actually I just did one yesterday, which is why I was late. Um, as soon as they answer, I don't give them the opportunity to ask me questions about who I am. Hey, this is Martha from accounting and extension, blah, blah, blah. I can't get this to work. So by telling them all that information up front, they don't even think twice about, oh, maybe this person isn't authorized because I've already given them all the information that they may ask for. Practice it. It sounds really silly, but sit down with somebody. It doesn't have to be a coworker. It can be somebody at home. Practice how you're going to go through this. Put yourself on the other end of that phone call. Somebody called you up and, and asked you for something that seems a little fishy. You know, what kind of questions would you ask that person? Star 6-7 is your friend. Be sure you use it or use a caller ID spoofer. No, don't just use your cell phone and not sanitize your number before it goes out. Have an exit strategy. This is where a lot of people slip up because you need two exit strategies for every social engineering engagement that you're going to do. One is if you get the information that you're looking for. So normally if you talk this person out of some information like a username or password reset or whatever, you don't go, oh, okay, thanks, bye. You know, you don't want them to know that you know, you're just after that data and then you're out. Now ask them another question. Oh, okay, that's cool. Um, you know, what was the address for uh, the time card sheet again? Just something very just off the wall that they would know that they're, gets their focus off of that sensitive question. So when they hang up the phone with you, they're probably not going to remember the sensitive data that they gave you in the middle of the conversation, they're going to remember the end of the conversation. So as long as you make that ending something that's part of their everyday job, you won't raise any suspicions. The other exit strategy you need is if your attempt is unsuccessful. So if I call a help desk and they ask for an employee ID number or some piece of information that I don't have, I need a good way of getting out of that other than going, uh, and hanging up the phone. Right, you know, that's, that's going to tip somebody off that something's not right. If I don't have the answer to a question, I usually make my cell phone ring because I'm holding it in my hand. Oh, um, I need to take this call. Let me call you back really quick. Something simple, something believable that doesn't raise their suspicion. Just don't hang up. So I think we covered this pretty well already. You know, what kind of information do you think that you should have before you call a help desk? Anybody? This is the audience participation portion of this cop room. Back there.
I got username. That's all I could hear. <laughs> Employee ID number. Cool. Um, what else? Anything else? Maybe uh, what department that person works in? That might be a good thing to know. Um, who their boss is. That, that's kind of another good thing to know is uh, your chain. Yeah. That too. The watering hole. You need to know where that person is. <laughs> Those are good. This venue isn't very good for, for audience questions and answers. Let's move on. Let's talk about physical attacks. Physical attacks are kind of cool. Uh, they take a lot of preparation, though, especially if you want to do something in a medium to high security environment. Um, smaller shops that are more lax on security, that's a little easier. But when you start to get into buildings that have card re readers at each door, maybe biometric devices. You know, you need, to, you need to do some prep work to understand what you're up against there. Sometimes you have more than one target area. So in a lot of my engagements, I have to do multiple buildings in multiple states. So it, it usually takes me a little while to prep for each one. But the internet is a great place, right? It really helps us with that. Google Maps will show us pretty much what the building looks like without ever having to leave home. So at this point, I can spot probably where the, the main doors are into that building, entry and exit points. I can maybe get a look at where their trash is kept. If you're going to do a dumpster dive, that's good to know. Uh, what's in the area? You know, is there a Starbucks right around in there? If there's a Starbucks close to that building, you are golden. You can sit there all day, watch the badges come in and out. You can watch the folks go in and out at lunchtime can see what their ID cards look like because they don't take them off when they leave the building. Why would they do that? Nobody cares. You also need to look at what they're wearing. Sounds kind of weird, but if you're going to do a physical penetration test and you're going to pretend to be an employee, you should probably be dressed similar to them. And we already talked about Google Maps. Um, dumpster diving, right? So a lot of times companies literally throw away their secrets. I did one of these uh, a couple weeks ago <laughs> in the snow, and uh, we found documents with their uh, compliance things in them. So lots of sensitive data there. I, it's being recorded, so I kind of have to step around some of the stuff, but you'd be amazed. So what do we want to be for our cover? All right, this also depends on the kind of environment that you're getting into. You know, we talked about a little bit about being an employee, a vendor. You know, I know what you're supposed to look like. Um, I do all of my, my vendor shopping at the thrift store. So whatever the thrift store usually has that day, that's probably what I'm going to be. Office Depot, Symantec, whatever. Just don't tell them you're from Legat. You also want to accessorize. Sounds a little girly, but if you're going to go in as the telephone repairman, you should probably have some tools that look like they're used for for telephone repair. You probably shouldn't walk in with a hammer. Business cards. Anybody a fan of the Rockford Files? Right? It's a classic. He printed out business cards for whoever he needed to be that day. Same thing goes here. It's always good to have one of your buddies back in the office to be your supervisor, too. So in case they get suspicious, you can say, oh, well, you know, hey, here, call and talk to my boss. So here's their phone number. They, they can verify that I'm supposed to be here. Uh, work orders are good, too. So I kind of answered most of these questions. Uh, if you're going to be the telephone repair guy, what's the most important thing that you need to have, accessory-wise? Alignment handset? That's good. Um, what about a hard hat? Hard hats are important. Um, it has to be the right kind of hard hat, too. Uh, white ones are for usually emergency workers if you're doing anything in the SCADA environment. So you don't want a white one. Um, also, there's nobody out there that wears a hard hat for a living that doesn't have at least one sticker on that hard hat. So put some stickers on it so it looks like it's realistic. You also need to bang it up, right? It, it shouldn't look like that you just went out to Lowe's and bought the new non-white hard hat and slapped some stickers on it. So if you can find one at the thrift store, you can find a used one from a family member, use that one instead. Um, gloves are another really important one. Uh, we had a guy that was doing 
this exact scenario once, and uh, he got busted because the undercover cop noticed he didn't have any uh, gloves in his little tool belt, and that his tool belt looked just a little bit too new. So again, thrift stores are the best places to shop. Make sure that it looks like you've been using it, like it's for your job. Authorization letter. Okay, if you're going to go do a physical pen test, you need to have your get out of jail free card with you. Please be sure that whoever is listed as the emergency contact on that letter is actually going to be there that day. Otherwise, you are in for a long wait. So a lot of companies are starting to rely on proximity cards to get their employees in and out of the building. This is a pretty cool technology, and so is this. Anybody who has not used a Proxmark 3, it's used to clone RFID cards or other smaller devices like that. Um, if it's in a pocket, you can power it with one of the, the mini USB power packs, and you can walk around and record and replay RFIDs without ever having to use the computer. It's fantastic. Check it out, proxmark3.com. Um, I used one of these a while back to get into a data center, and the client told me that that was cheating because the bad guys would never do bad things like clone or steal cards. Because that's, that's just not realistic. So if you're gonna do some physical pen testing, here's some other cool tools that you might need to keep with you. Lock picks are cool. Um, that, that square up there is a blank ID card. You can't really see it that well. Most of the time, I don't even worry about trying to make a fake ID card. I just wear a blank one because people assume that it's an ID card for that building that's just been flipped around as I was walking. Uh, this didn't work for me once so far, and that was where a company had ID cards that were two-sided. So they, they got a, a good little, you know, hey, that's a good job and their report for that. Um, too bad that you could clone them, but uh, anyway. Tile lifters are good if you're gonna go into an environment with a raised floor. Flashlights, cameras, so balloons. That's not really something that you would think about with physical pen testing, is it? Coat hangers, kinda strange. Let me explain. So you have these cool, very scary looking secure doors. Looks very heavy. It's got a card reader on the outside. On the inside, it's got one of these little white boxes there. So anybody that's kind of worked in an environment where there are prox coated doors, you know that you swipe your card to get in. That will release the magnetic latch on the top there. Keep seeing that you can't see where I'm pointing. And, uh, <laughs> and open the door. So the white box up there, for those of you who aren't familiar with these kinds of systems, is a motion sensor. So when you're walking to leave the building, you don't have to touch anything to get the door to unlock. As you approach that motion sensor, it will automatically unlock the door for you. This is really cool. Um, this is even cooler if the door on the outside has a really big gap at the bottom like this one does. So out of that coat hanger, you can make a little flag that you slide underneath the door. You wave it around using the, the we heart our customers paper that came with it. And eventually if you wave enough and get it out there pretty far, it will engage that device and release the lock on the door and you can walk in. Um, another cool thing for these is sometimes they adjust the, the range of detection to go out further so that people can't use the coat hanger. This is where the balloons come in. And you need the balloons that look like these ones here, like the ones that like the clown uses at the birthday parties. Because when you put it underneath the door, you use the little hand pump to blow it all the way up. Then when you let it go, it goes everywhere in the room and releases that latch. The only bad part about this technique is if it doesn't work, then there's like a pile of balloons on the other side of the door <laughs> and you can't get in to, uh, <laughs> to collect them. Uh, one more thing I want to point out, whoops, with the door, as soon as I figure out how to use my computer. Um, there's one more vulnerability with this door, uh, and I'm not sure if anybody has used these kinds of techniques enough to see it. Where are the hinges on that door? On the outside. So if you use just a straight file or a roofing nail, something that's, you know, small enough that it can fit in the hole that's in the bottom of that, that hinge, and a hammer, you can have that door off with two people in about 30 seconds. 
So if you can't get it on latch, you can just kind of take it off and sort of prop it open. But you got to be fast about it. 30 seconds, you can practice, it's not hard. All right. So if we don't really want to do a phone test or a physical test, or if we're going to do the all-inclusive deluxe package, we also want to include some, some virtual techniques, right? So we talk about fishing a lot. Fishing is cool um, because it works every time. I've never had an engagement where I've included fishing where at least one person didn't click on that link or open that document. You know how to get security people at corporations to open malicious documents, right? You title it as Discounted Sands Training. It's really mean, but it really works. <laughs> Just don't send it to your person that's the contact that renews your contract or else you're not going back there next year. They don't like it when you get the person in charge. Um, I like to purchase domains for these so that when I send my malicious links, I don't have to rely on HTML to hide what the address actually is. That way, if they're using something like a mail marshal or some kind of service like that, it usually slides right past. Um, especially if you cough up the money and purchase the SSL certificate. Um, I haven't had any of my phishing emails that have SSL enabled websites bounce back at me ever. Um, QR code phishing, that one's kind of fun. You can make a, a QR code for a malicious website and you can put it in any kind of document you want. So we did this a while back and we put it on flyers for free pizza and we put them on cars in the parking lot. <laughs> It's kind of like the new infected USB, right? Except for it's cooler. We got a lot of hits off of that. <laughs> and they didn't get any free pizza. Fake social media profiles. These ones work really well in conjunction with a phishing attack. So a lot of times, the, the mid-level C folks, you know, kind of like the, the CISO, they may not necessarily have a, a LinkedIn account or a Twitter account. So I'll, I'll kindly make one for them. And then I'll go out and I'll start linking up with all their employees and following all their employees. If your boss links in with you on LinkedIn, are you, are you going to not link back up with that person? I don't think that would be a very good idea. And the same goes with Twitter. So if your boss follows you, you're probably going to follow your boss back, right? If your boss posts a link, especially a shortened link in Twitter, because that's just a great tool, and says, this is really good information. Everybody that works for me should know about this. Are you going to click on it? A lot of people do. So you can combine these attacks um, to achieve the same results. It's just a little bit different. I mean, phishing works, but I like to mix it up a little bit with longstanding clients. The Social Engineering Toolkit makes this extremely easy. Um, if you haven't used the Social Engineering Toolkit, it's full of fantastic goodies, um, like a malicious QR code generator. Um, it also, this isn't the slide that I was looking for. It also incorporates with Metasploit. So you have the option to drop Metasploit payloads once they click on those malicious links if their machines are vulnerable. I tend not to use those because you kind of have to hide them to get them through the AV if they have decent AV on their email systems. And it's just, I don't know, it's just a lot of work and you don't really, the payoff isn't as good because it usually gets gobbled up when they open it. So I like to use the, the credential harvester option. And this actually has the ability to go out and clone a real production website and host it on your machine. So when I send the link and I register my domain and it points out to my registered domain, the email gets delivered. Except for I'm running set, so I'm actually cloning their website. So I like to clone their website for something like OWA or their, their timesheets or something that looks very similar to it. So when I send those emails out, they click on my link, they fill out their username and their password, and set will return everything that they put in a post field back to me. So in the red there toward the bottom, you'll see the email address and you'll see the really leet password. So it just makes things a lot easier. And then once you're done, you hit Control-C and it prints a really pretty report for you. So I don't have to write. That makes me even happier. So we have all this really cool stuff. We totally own this company, right? 
none of that does any good unless you can effectively tell them how you did it and how for it not to happen again. So use pictures, use videos, record your phone calls if they authorize it first. You know, show them the big picture because it's usually not one social engineering attack that leads to the ultimate compromise of a company. It's usually a chain of those attacks. Put it together so that management can understand it. Um, real quick, I got a couple of minutes left. Doing social engineering exploits is really fun. I love it. Um, but again, you know, it's, it's not really doing us any good if we can't help teach companies how to defend against that. So I am developing um, the first, I do believe, uh, social engineering defensive framework. So the idea with this is to, to be able to give this to customers or to, you know, to, to people that are interested when they say, how can I stop social engineering attacks? So I'm working on something that I can just hand them. It'll give them kind of an outline of where they can get started. Um, I submitted it to ShmooCon. We'll see if that happens. If you're interested in reading it or if you want to contribute, just drop me an email, hit me up on Twitter. Um, it's going to be a completely community-based project. It's going to be open to everybody. There's no secret sauce, no 30-day trial. You don't have to give me any money to check it out. Um, and that is all the time I have. So this is me. I appreciate your time, and I'll see you guys later. Okay, we do have time for any questions, if possible. Anybody have a question? I guess not. Okay, great, thanks.